This is a message for Logan Paul. Or Jake Paul. If either of you are watching, I'm mostly just grateful for your time! That's right. I'm here to call you out. Throw down the gauntlet. Challenge you to one match of professional boxing. Or chess! I know you've been expecting this. Watching through my three-part series on Gita Boards, Situation is Treatise, Society of the Spectacle, thinking, when's this guy gonna glove up? Well, here I am, and I am ready to rumble. But I would also be willing to entertain the option of chess. That's right, six rounds. No, eight rounds without headgear. Just mano a mano between the ropes. Or five minutes on the clock each for a game of blitz. I'll meet you anytime, anywhere. Madison Square Gardens, you betcha. Caesars Palace, my ticket is already booked. Chess.com, actually that sounds pretty convenient for all involved, now I think about it. No, I know what you're thinking. You're both athletic young men. I bet you can both do like a whole presser. You're looking at me like, oh, oh, this guy's got the build of a chess whiz, not a boxing champ. Well, surprise, surprise, I'm not that good at chess either. I just really don't want a broken nose. So I guess I might see one of you boys in the ring. Rival bloody, check your mate. In May 2021, the sports finance website Sportico revealed the top three highest paid boxers of the previous 12 months. The list was topped by super middleweight world champion Canelo Alvarez, with world heavyweight champion Anthony Joshua coming in second. The third spot proved more controversial. That was claimed by YouTuber, musician and former Disney Channel star Jake Paul. The unexpected phenomenon of YouTuber boxing, which led to this scenario, began in 2017, when vlogger Joe Weller uploaded a 6 minute and 22 second video of an amateur sparring match that he'd undertaken with fellow British creator Theo Baker. The match was fairly understated, taking place in an empty gym in New Haven, East Sussex. After beating Baker by decision, Weller declared himself the champion of boxing on YouTube and challenged another British YouTuber, KSI, to a follow-up match. The resulting bout between Weller and KSI was a much, much bigger affair. Held in the Copper Box Arena in London's Olympic Park, the fight drew an in-person audience of 7,500 people, with 1.6 million watching live online. In the end, however, KSI's thrashing of Weller proved to be but a warm-up for what was to come. The years since have seen social media stars lining up to step into the ring and attempt to knock each other senseless. Perhaps the purest example of this trend was the June 2021 Social Gloves event, in which seven YouTubers fought seven TikTokers in a so-called battle of the platforms. Yet, it is Logan and Jake Paul who have emerged as the true winners of YouTuber boxing, despite the fact that Logan has never won a single fight. The rambunctious brothers from Ohio are the only YouTubers to have broken the cycle of merely fighting other creators. Jake knocked out ex-wrestler Ben Askren in just two rounds in April 2021. And two months later, Logan managed to avoid getting knocked out by Floyd Mayweather. Some might question the Paul brothers' technique, or whether either would be able to stand their ground against currently active professionals. In Jake's fight with Nate Robinson, one of the commentators stated, quite simply, that what we are seeing. That's the front of the belt, guys. No disrespect to either person, but really doesn't resemble boxing. At the same time, it's hard to criticise their work ethic. Both Logan and Jake have clearly approached boxing with a real dedication, pushing their minds and bodies to their limits. The question which remains is, why? What is the purpose of all of this? The cynics among you will presumably answer, money. And that's obviously a factor. 
Logan Paul reportedly hoped to walk away from his fight with Mayweather a cool $20 million richer. Others might highlight that the Pauls have had sporting ambitions since childhood. Both wrestled at high school, and so perhaps they've simply used their platforms to enable them to pursue a childhood dream. Again, probably a factor. Without discounting those influences, however, I want to take a different perspective, and to look at the Paul brothers' pivot to boxing as an act of storytelling. In one of the press conferences leading up to Logan's second match with KSI, Logan overtly framed the fight in such narrative terms. He said that KSI just happens to be the guy in the ring for me. This is the end of a redemption arc that uh, has changed my life. Similar acknowledgements have peppered both brothers' answers in interviews surrounding these matches. This idea of redemption is one we'll come back to several times within this video. It goes without saying that both Paul brothers had pretty terrible reputations prior to their starting to box. Logan attracted the ire of what felt like the entire internet, or maybe the entire world in 2017, when he gleefully filmed the body of a person who had died by suicide in a Japanese forest. We'd be here for hours if I tried to list Jake's various indiscretions, but they were enough that, in 2018, tens of millions of people chose to tune into a YouTube series which seriously sought to consider whether he might be a sociopath. Whether either brother has been successful in achieving some kind of public redemption for these acts, something which Logan seems far, far more interested in than Jake, it's perhaps too early to say. Regardless, in using boxing specifically as a medium of atonement, as a means to try and prove to the world that they have the ability to change, the Paul brothers have tapped into a set of well-established tropes surrounding the sport. Some of these are the product of the unique and complicated history of boxing itself. Others have been established through how the sport has been represented in art and storytelling, most notably in film. Over the course of this video, we're going to try and pick out some of these themes, tropes and conventions, explore their origins, and analyse how the Paul brothers have used, and perhaps abused, them in paving their roads to redemption. I want to be clear that when I suggest that we can view Logan and Jake Paul's budding boxing careers as acts of storytelling, I'm not suggesting that their matches have been staged or fixed in any way. It's tempting to think as much. Some cried foul when the first fight between Logan Paul and KSI ended in a majority draw, suggesting the result was a bit too convenient. That both fighters were talking about a rematch just minutes after the final bell only further invited suspicion, given that that rematch went on to earn them $900,000 just for showing up. Now, both brothers have clearly been careful in picking their fights. Jake Paul's three victories by knockout, two against former professional athletes, may sound pretty impressive. But watching the matches reveals all three opponents to be pretty laughable in their boxing abilities. Similarly, Logan's massive height, weight, reach and age advantage allowed him to easily avoid being knocked out by Mayweather by clinching for dear life. Yet, yeah, even if it wasn't, likely pretty illegal, I can't see either brother wanting to fix a match. Both seem to want to earn the respect of the boxing establishment and to be seen as real boxers. When I suggest that Logan and Jake Paul's boxing careers are as much about storytelling as sport, then I'm not really suggesting anything out of the ordinary. For this is pretty much always the case with boxing. Joyce Carol Oates writes that, Boxing in its greatest moments suggests the bloody fifth act of classic tragedies, in which that mysterious element we call plot achieves closure. The build-up to a boxing match is so long, with whatever bad blood exists between the combatants aggravated in tense press conferences and brash interviews, that the fight itself appears as the climactic distillation of a much longer narrative. 
sometimes we're actively sold these stories by the people organising a fight. Muhammad Ali and George Foreman's rumble in the jungle, for instance, took place in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, for the sole reason that the country's authoritarian dictator agreed to pay for it. Yet Don King, the fight's promoter, spanned the holding of the match in Africa as a political choice. King arranged for the fight to be preceded by a concert featuring James Brown and B.B. King in order to position the match as a pan-Africanist celebration of black achievement. Other aspects of these narratives develop more organically. To stick with the same example, it's hard to overstate the extent to which many white Americans hated Muhammad Ali. He was black, a Muslim, outspoken on issues of racial injustice, and eight years previously had been stripped of his boxing licence and sent to prison for refusing to serve in the Vietnam War. George Foreman, by contrast, wore his patriotism with pride. During the 1968 Olympic Games, just days after John Carlos and Tommy Smith had lowered their heads and raised gloved fists in protest at the conditions suffered by black Americans, Foreman had celebrated his gold medal by pointedly and proudly waving a US flag. Each boxer thus represented a very different response to racism in America. This ensured that most people viewed the fight as far more than a simple sporting contest, and instead as a playing out of these political tensions. The boxing saga of Jake and Logan Paul has involved both processes of narrative attribution. There was certainly little in the way of animosity between KSI and Logan prior to the announcement of their first match, and they appeared to be fairly happy to be around each other when KSI appeared on Logan's podcast in July 2021. Inventing a bitter rivalry through vlogs and music videos, however, ensured people would be far more invested, and thus more likely to pay to watch, than if they merely positioned it as a bit of fun. This purposefully circulated story was then augmented by people's pre-existing love or hatred for either creator and their previous endeavours. As I mentioned previously, however, I think there's a longer game being played here. When Jake and then Logan stepped onto a temporary stage outside the LA Coliseum wearing flamboyant suits and imposing sunglasses in June 2018, they were laying the groundwork for something much bigger than a single boxing match. And as we're going to explore in the rest of this video, the story for which this was the opening scene took less influence from the sport of boxing itself than from the genre conventions which have emerged in the fictional stories in which that sport has featured. Given the manner in which boxing itself seems to invite spectators and fans to imbue fights with narrative meaning, it's perhaps no surprise that artists and writers have long drawn inspiration from the sport. Predecessors of modern day boxing appear in both Homer's Iliad and Virgil's Aeneid. Lord Byron, John Keats, Charles Dickens, George Bernard Shaw, Jack London and Ernest Hemingway all found opportunity to express their love of boxing in their work. Nevertheless, it is the cinema which has had the biggest impact on the themes that we associate with the sports. Filmmakers have been drawn to boxing since the very earliest days of the medium. As Dan Striebel writes, during the first 20 years of cinema, films of boxers and prize fights constituted one of the medium's most conspicuous genres. Several recordings of title bouts garnered huge profits for both the early motion picture trade and the promoters of boxing. Boxing has been a consistent presence on the silver screen ever since, even during periods where the popularity of the sport itself has waned. There have been some subtle variations in the kinds of stories that screenwriters and directors have chosen to tell about boxing. Legger Grindon suggests that the history of the boxing genre on screen can be divided into six cycles in which different themes – criminality, masculinity, ethnicity to name but a few – have been more or less prominent. Even so, a core collection of tropes and conventions have become staple ingredients recognisable to anyone who's seen more than one boxing film. 
In seeking to unpack some of these conventions, I think it would be weird to begin with anything other than Rocky. For Sylvester Stallone's 1976 feature is the archetypal example of the modern boxing film. Shot on a budget of just $1,075,000, the film obliterated the expectations of its own studio, going on to win three Oscars and to launch a franchise which currently consists of eight films and shows no signs of stopping. Moreover, its impact on the wider genre has been seismic. In highlighting some of the tropes that the Paul brothers have drawn on, I'm mostly going to focus on films which have been released since the first Rocky, and the influence that the Italian Stallion exerts on all of them is unmistakable. For the uninitiated, Rocky is the story of Rocky Balboa. By day an enforcer for a loan shark, by night a club fighter who boxes in dingy venues in front of jeering crowds for pitiful amounts of money. Rocky is a loner. Even Mickey, the owner of the gym that he trains at, holds him in low esteem, considering Rocky to have once had great potential, but to have been too lazy or scared or stupid to take advantage of it. And then, by an unthinkable twist of fate, the heavyweight champion of the world, Apollo Creed, invites Rocky to challenge him for the title. After some hesitation, Rocky agrees. He trains and trains and trains. He couples up with the cashier at the local pet shop and eventually he defies all the odds. He doesn't beat Creed, but he does become the first person to make it to the end of a fight with the champ without being knocked out. Rocky then is a story about second chances. And not so much about whether people who have done bad things deserve a second chance, than about the bravery it can take to accept such an opportunity. At the end of the film, we don't care that Rocky doesn't beat Creed. His loss to Creed feels like far more of a victory than his win against Spider Rico in the opening scene. Because Rocky making it to the end of that fight is the product of a psychological shift in which he has committed himself to trying to be a better person. It's this effort, not the outcome, through which Rocky is redeemed in the eyes of Mickey and the rest of the world. This idea that boxing might be a means through which a person might find redemption has dominated all subsequent boxing films. As Frederick V. Romano writes, once a useful theme for the screenwriter's consideration, redemption has evolved into something more akin to a mandated element of their story. In Raging Bull, Jake LaMotta hopes that the punches he takes in the ring might serve as penance for the violence he inflicts on his friends and family outside of it. In Cinderella Man, James J. Braddock attempts to claim restitution both for sporting failures earlier in his life and for his inability to provide for his kids during the Great Depression. In Million Dollar Baby, Frankie Dunn's training of Maggie Fitzgerald offers him the chance to make up for his non-existent relationship with his daughter. Finally, in Southpaw, Billy Hope seeks not only to reclaim the championship belt, but also to find forgiveness for the role that his quickness to anger played in both the murder of his wife and in his daughter being taken into care. This connection between boxing and redemption can occasionally seem arbitrary. The key, however, as in Rocky, is generally the monastic levels of discipline and dedication the sport requires. A fighter will often train for months, albeit usually compacted into a montage on screen, cutting themselves off from family and friends to prepare for a single fight which might last only minutes. Boxers also put themselves into highly vulnerable positions. Half naked on a raised platform, it is a very lucky boxer who leaves the ring without notable injuries. Death is not an impossibility. Whatever flaws a character might have, and whatever transgressions they might have committed, taking those risks and many, many punches acts as a public display of self-punishment and self-renewal. When Logan and Jake Paul chose boxing as the medium through which they would complete what Logan described as their redemption arc, then 
they were stepping into a cultural space where such themes already abound. We're already primed to interpret boxing stories, whether in works of complete fiction or in the semi-scripted reality TV shows that are the lives of the Paul brothers, as ones in which characters will be seeking atonement for former wrongs. Despite the fact that Logan has failed to win a single fight, or perhaps Rocky style because of it, the expectations that the boxing genre has planted in our minds encourages us to hear the final bell as an absolution of sin. Now, it would be entirely possible to simply leave this video here, yet I'd like to dig a little deeper into some of these specific tropes which Logan and Jake Paul have been drawing on. For I think doing so raises some really interesting questions about how we view the Paul brothers, how we view boxing, and maybe how we view the world more broadly. But before we do that, I want to help you increase your self-defense capabilities online by telling you about today's video sponsor, Surfshark, the heavyweight champion of VPN services. Protect yourself online by heading to surfshark.deals forward slash Tom Nicholas to get 83% off a two year plan and an extra three months for free, allowing you to privately and securely browse the web for just $2.21 a month. Now, you might not be a disgraced YouTuber looking for public redemption, although hello Logan and Jake if you are watching. Nevertheless, we can all benefit from doing more to protect ourselves from trackers and malware online. Surfshark allows you to control what websites and your internet service provider can see about who you are and what you get up to through essentially creating a private internet connection to keep you safe and secure whenever you're online. Surfshark has loads and loads of features. I really like having the ability to trick websites into thinking I'm in other countries. This is great when used with streaming services as it can allow you to get access to region locked platforms such as BBC iPlayer where you can currently watch Leon Gast's excellent documentary, When We Were Kings, which tells the inside story of Muhammad Ali and George Foreman's rumble in the jungle. Or you can unlock loads of extra content through accessing other countries' versions of Netflix and the like. So if you want to take advantage of that time-limited offer of 83% off a two-year plan and an extra three months for free, you can support the channel by letting them know that I sent you through heading to surfshark.deals forward slash Tom Nicholas. Right, now, back on with the show. Following Logan Paul's second fight with KSI, which KSI won by split decision, his brother Jake took to Twitter with a message for fans. A good chunk of the hastily typed dispatch was taken up by accusations of foul play, surrounding the referee's decision to deduct two points from Logan for striking KSI on the back of the head while he was knocked down. Towards the end, however, the post turned more celebratory. Following a congratulations to his brother, Jake implored his fans to, please remember, we're two kids from Ohio who followed our dreams and had fun doing so. We never had sh We owned a landscaping company and worked for minimum wage. This is insane. If we can accomplish anything, so can you. This is far from the only time that Jake Paul has characterized his life as an inspiring rags to riches tale. Talking to Snoop Dogg following his victory against Ben Askren, Jake gave a speech which hit many of the same beats. He told the rapper that, I used to landscape. I just had a dream and I chased it and I worked hard. In addition to this, both brothers have ensured that ring announcers have foregrounded their Ohio origins whilst welcoming them into the ring. Fighting out of Dorado, Puerto Rico, by way of Westlake, Ohio. This is perhaps partly just a case of good old-fashioned hometown pride, but also further helps the brothers to curate an aura of blue-collar, midwestern working classness. What one can piece together from publicly available information about the Paul brothers' childhoods suggests that these attempts to portray themselves as having come up from nothing are a bit of a stretch. They grew up in a detached house surrounded by 1.7 acres of land, which Jake, in his 2016 memoir, You've Gotta Want It, 
describes him and Logan driving their personal ATVs around. Zillow currently estimates that house to be worth around $462,400. That's 57% more than the US national average. Elsewhere in his book, Jake also describes their parents buying him and his brother a MacBook to edit videos on when they were just 10 and 12 years old. Whilst the Paul brothers might not have had any help from familial connections in the entertainment industry to launch their careers, as is the case with many other stars then, it seems fair to say that their lives growing up were more than comfortable. Their minimum wage landscaping work seems to be more in the vein of an evening or weekend job than that of a family being desperate for cash. The problem is, comfortably upper middle class kids don't make for great main characters in boxing stories. See, boxing films almost invariably centre on working class protagonists. As mentioned earlier, before his first clash with Apollo Creed, Rocky lives in a tiny apartment in the deprived Kensington neighbourhood of Philadelphia and is a loan shark's goon. Maggie, in Million Dollar Baby, takes half-eaten leftover burgers home from her waitressing job for her dinner. Cinderella Man foregrounds the struggle of all of its characters during the Great Depression, whilst in a slightly different mode, the fighter extracts endless amounts of comedy from Mickey Ward's large and raucous Irish Catholic family. The strength of this association between boxing narratives and struggling working class protagonists is confirmed by the few examples of boxing films in which the main characters start off already living the good life. Every single one of the Rocky sequels finds some excuse for our hero to be training in some ramshackle gym, despite him being one of the most famous athletes in the world. In Creed, Donnie moves to a flat in Philadelphia, which seems more than a little modest for someone who was previously an executive at a securities firm and presumably has a very, very, very large inheritance. In Southpaw, a brief scene in which Billy Hope's accountant tells him that he's out of cash similarly downgrades our protagonist from mansion-dwelling world champion to gym-cleaning schmuck. This focus on working-class characters is reflective of boxing as it exists in the real world. Throughout history, prize fighters and professional boxers have tended to come from deprived backgrounds. It's not hard to see why. Boxing is dangerous, and so most people, given another choice, would probably avoid it. In fact, in 1956, the journalist and sports writer A.J. Liebling feared that certain generalised conditions today, like full employment and a late school leaving age, militate against the development of first-rate boxers. He worried that, given the options of a steady job and or continuing education, poor kids would be less likely to turn to boxing as a potential route out of poverty. Alongside being true to life, the centering of working class stories in the boxing genre feeds our desire to root for an underdog. The screenwriting theorist Robert McKee writes that a protagonist and their story can only be as intellectually fascinating and emotionally compelling as the forces of antagonism make them. How harsher could the odds be, and thus more compelling the story, than the idea that a character could, through boxing, rise from abject poverty to fame and fortune? When Logan and Jake Paul present themselves as having had difficult upbringings, they are therefore partly trying to comply with the accepted conventions regarding what kind of person boxing narratives should focus on. Had Jake talked to Snoop Dogg about how his dad was a real estate agent and how he was educated in a school district which is currently ranked 45th out of 608 in the state of Ohio, it would likely have sounded somewhat dissonant within the context of a boxing ring. Alongside this, they are partaking in a pastime loved by rich people of all stripes, deflecting privilege. Wealthy people love to obfuscate the various advantages they were gifted in life, and to pretend that their success is all their own doing. In 2019, Elon Musk, presently the richest person on the planet, had a cutesy back and forth with his mum on Twitter, in which he described a time when he 
couldn't afford to pay for repairs on his car and so fixed almost everything from parts in the junkyard. In truth, both Musk's parents were incredibly well off. To quote his father, we were very wealthy. We had so much money at times we couldn't even close our safe. Musk might have chosen to fix his car from secondhand parts as a fun project, but he's never in his life been anywhere near a situation where that would be a necessity. In a brilliant paper published in Sociology in 2021, Sam Friedman, Dave O'Brien and Ian MacDonald suggest that such instances of those with middle class and elite upbringings obscuring their privilege is not even necessarily an act of sinister deception. It can be as much about the Paul brothers, Elon Musk, or anyone else for that matter, reassuring themselves that their success is their own doing. With regard to the Paul brothers, however, I think there's something more specific going on, which, again, seems to have been drawn from boxing and the tropes which a century's worth of films have attached to it. And it all comes down to what sociologists call respectability. The desire, or perhaps need, to be seen by the society around us as respectable. As we'll see, this phenomenon is intricately tied to class and to deeply classist notions of who in our society deserves admiration and who should be treated with contempt or suspicion. Yet, it would also seem fair to describe Logan and Jake Paul's dilemma prior to their turn to boxing as being rooted in a perceived lack of respectability in the eyes of our collective culture. That, alongside boxing, Logan Paul has turned to podcasting, a form which I would argue many view as more sophisticated and refined than YouTube or any other form of online video, further suggests that it is a more respectable image that he's looking for. But what is it about boxing specifically which makes it such a powerful tool for claiming such an image? As you can probably imagine, I watched a lot of boxing films while I was researching this video, far more than I've actually managed to squeeze in mentions of. Among these, one stuck out. Gentleman Jim is based on the true story of James J. Corbett, who, in 1892, beat John L. Sullivan to become the second world heavyweight champion of gloved boxing. Corbett affirmed several precedents for the sport, where previous boxers such as Sullivan had fought at least some of their matches with bare fists, Corbett fought exclusively with padded gloves. He also cemented the use of the so-called Marquess of Queensbury rules, which, among other things, banned wrestling moves, limited the duration of rounds to three minutes, and introduced the ten count, in which a referee counts to ten before ruling a fighter knocked out. Throughout the film, it's suggested that what separates Corbett from other fighters is that he is respectable. Where other boxers, Sullivan included, are presented as half-drunk, barbaric bruisers, Corbett is a sportsman through and through. It's this respectable affect, this perception of having a level of grace and decorum, which enables Corbett to gain the patronage and friendship of wealthy backers at the San Francisco Olympic Club, who wouldn't give so much as the time of day to any of the more disreputable boxers featured in the film. The sociologist Beverly Skeggs writes that this notion of respectability is one of the most ubiquitous signifiers of class. The idea began to become of particular importance in the 19th century. In many countries in the global north, the period was one of rife inequality, and the way in which the middle and upper classes learned to live with that inequality was by telling themselves that working class people actually deserved to be poor. As Jeffrey Best writes, respectability was a style of living understood to show a proper respect for morals and morality. As a rule, the rich were considered to be intrinsically moral and respectable, whilst working class people were deemed disreputable until proven otherwise. The pursuit of respectability comes up time and again in boxing films. 
It usually goes hand in hand with the protagonist's pursuit of redemption. Rocky does not only go the distance with Apollo Creed, he also leaves behind a life of crime and gets a girlfriend and a dog. Billy Hope in Southpaw is a particularly interesting example here. At both the beginning and end of the film, Hope is world light heavyweight champion and super rich. The difference is that at the end of the film, Hope has learnt to deal with his anger management issues and proved himself to be a good father in the eyes of the state. In short, he has become respectable. A core part of both characters' arcs, then, is their securing of a level of middle-class respectability. Nevertheless, we shouldn't take this to mean that boxing films represent some radical critique of classist notions of what is moral and respectable. For they tend to portray their heroes as exceptional in this regard suggesting that their particular ability to become respectable runs counter to what it is implied as an inherent tendency among most other working class people to live dysfunctional and disreputable lives. This often seems to be foregrounded in boxing films through pairing the protagonist up with another character, who, through the course of the film, proves themselves to be unable to gain the same level of respectability. In a 2011 article in the Journal of Sport and Social Sciences, James Rhodes writes of the fighter that the respectability of Mickey Ward is produced in relation to the dysfunctional identities displayed by his crack-addicted brother and his sisters, who display the hallmarks of a white trash identity. A very similar device exists in other films, where Rocky grows up to become a hard worker, a patriot, and a loving husband and father Paulie remains a laughable slop. In Cinderella Man, Paddy Constantine's character, Mike Wilson, similarly serves as a point of contrast to Braddock's honour and respectability in his constant drunkenness. Such characters thus serve as points of contrast for our heroes, while also discouraging us from either thinking that all working class people might be able to become respectable, or further, questioning the classist terms on which the definition of what behaviours are considered respectable in the first place are. So how do Logan and Jake Paul fit into all of this? Well, as mentioned previously, if we wanted to quickly summarise the brothers' predicament prior to their embrace of boxing, it would probably be that neither were deemed respectable. This is true in relation to some of the specific controversies which surrounded them, such as Logan's Japanese Forest video, but also their more general positioning within our culture. The Pauls were YouTubers, vloggers, influencers, pranksters. They were young, boisterous, and not particularly academic. In short, they were representative of a whole collection of attributes which as a culture, we tend to view as of little value and often as actively harmful to society. Interestingly, both Logan and Jake have played into this perception during their short boxing careers. At the press conference held in LA prior to the brothers' boxing debuts against KSI and Deji, the poor seem to embrace the roles of the antagonists. They turned up wearing obnoxiously gaudy suits and chanted along with pride when some of the crowd began to chant F*** the Pauls. Furthermore, both chose nicknames which served to remind people of their previous reputations for obnoxiousness. Ever brand conscious, Logan is the Maverick, whilst Jake is the Problem Child. All of this, again, is part of the creation of a narrative which draws heavily on tropes from the stories which are told about boxing in the cinema. As with obfuscating their comfortable upbringings, actively highlighting their former indiscretions serves to make the Paul brothers' potential acquisition of a level of respectability appear even more hard won. It further emphasises that this is a redemption story and thus suggests that Logan and Jake might even deserve even more praise for proving that they had the capacity to change. Nevertheless, I do think it's important to take into account how this interacts with the classist foundations of ideas of respectability. 
Scholars such as Skeggs and Rhodes are keen to stress that the ways in which respectability is defined are deeply classist. The terms of who and what should be considered respectable are generally constructed around activities and behaviours already favoured by the middle class and elite. Moreover, ignores the manner in which one's material or socio-economic circumstances might affect the choices one is able to make in life. Let's take Rocky as an example. Could a pre-championship Rocky Balboa have chosen not to have taken up employment as the hired muscle for the local loan shark? Potentially, but his options weren't exactly great. In Rocky 2, much is made of the fact that Rocky only has basic reading skills. He is humiliated while trying to record an aftershave advert and is then turned down for an office job. Work in Philadelphia also just generally seems hard to come by in the world of the film. Rocky briefly works at the meat packing plant, but is soon let go when the firm decides to cut back on staff. While we might not agree with Rocky's former life as a mobster's goon then, it seems fair to say that Rocky's options for more respectable employment, as defined by middle-class moral understandings of the world, are a bit thin on the ground. A similar argument might be made about working-class youngsters who might engage in some of the behaviours that made Logan and Jake Paul so hated. A group of teenagers goofing around and pulling pranks in the park might be really annoying. They might be far, far worse than just annoying. In some cases, they might not have had a whole lot of other options for ways to spend their spare time. This particularly might be the case in somewhere like the UK, where youth services have had their budgets cut by 70% over the last decade. The manner in which the Paul brothers have dressed themselves up as blue-collar Midwestern boys who came from nothing implies that they similarly had no choice but to entertain themselves with the high-octane antics which made them famous. However, all the evidence would suggest that this isn't the case. Logan and Jake both had a plethora of choices laid out before them, and yes, initially as children, but increasingly as adults, consistently chose the path that led Logan to the Japanese forest and Jake to generally being Jake Paul. While engaging with these tropes has enabled the Paul brothers to make the redemption narrative they've spun around their boxing endeavours infinitely more compelling then, the question remains whether the boxing story is really the Paul brothers to tell. At his exhibition match with Floyd Mayweather in June 2021, Logan Paul entered the ring to the song From Now On from the musical The Greatest Showman. Regardless of whether either brother can prove themselves to be truly competitive as professional boxers, the epic tale that they've woven around their pugilistic exploits has certainly proven their capabilities as showmen. The whole saga has been deeply compelling. Whether one loves or hates the pools, few have been able to resist feeling something about their fights. As I hope to have shown throughout this video, much of the intrigue of the narrative framing around Logan and Jake Paul's turn to boxing is the result of their drawing upon well-established tropes and conventions from the boxing film genre. While the notion of YouTuber boxing might seem pretty strange and new, the boxing story of the Paul brothers has done what all good genre stories do, and use storytelling aspects which we are deeply familiar with through engaging with other stories in the same genre to subtly guide our expectations. In this way, a disgraced YouTuber stepping into the boxing ring is easily transformed into the final act of a hard-won redemption arc. At the same time, I think it's worth being critical of the white lies that the Paul brothers have had to tell in order to make this redemption plot fit within the mould of the wider genre. For whilst Logan and Jake are far from being alone in having implied that their more than comfortable childhoods were ones of scarcity and hardship, the tropes which they have engaged in telling this particular tale of redemption 
are ones with deeply classist implications. The boxing genre is one which, on the one hand, celebrates individual working class heroes who rise above their station, whilst on the other, framing all other working class people as intrinsically disreputable, immoral and unintelligent. And these narratives might be ones that we want to question, rather than further instill into our collective culture. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that it has been worthy of your time. Uh, if you've got anything out of it at all, then I'd be incredibly grateful if you'd consider sharing it with a friend, uh, either online or off, who you think might also get something out of it. Thank you as ever to Richard, to Sindri Nilsson, Kaya Lau, David Brothers, Max DeVos, Alan Gann, Luke Meyer, Gary, Dylan Gordon, Dick on Spain, Greg Miller, Bill Mitchell, Al Spigart, Zed C. Reese, Brent Cottle, Shab Kumar, Colin York, Anil, Alexander Blank, Niels Abilgard, Sophia R, President Dwayne Elizondo, Mountain Chew Herbert Camacho, Sergio Suarez, 2Bro2B, Teddy Zamborski and Russell for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you'd like to join them in supporting what I do here, um, whatever the hell this is, uh, whilst getting early access to videos, copies of the scripts to them and more, then you can find out how to do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thank you once again for watching and have a fantastic week.